Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, before we begin, can you just, um, in the chat window, just let us know that you can hear us and that everything's OK? Yay. Fantastic. Well, welcome to Mushroom Materials 101 with Grace Knight from Ecovative. This is the first webinar from the Biodesign webinar series. Uh, we're really glad to have you. I'm Dan Grushkin. I'm the executive director of the Biodesign Challenge. And I'm Vina Vijaykumar. I am the program manager of EDP. So the webinar series was created for participating students and instructors to uh, learn about the emerging field of biodesign and create really a foundation for co communication around what it is biodesign means and what we can do with it. Uh, this session and the next session we're sharing with the general public. Uh, so we're really excited to have you. Um, today's session is hosted by Ecovative, a materials company that's working with cutting edge biomaterials. Thank you, Ecovative, for being with us in BDC 2019. And yeah, and um, just before we begin, I wanted to make a quick announcement as well. As Dan mentioned, we have one more uh, webinar that's going to be open to the general public, which is next Wednesday, uh, 7 p.m. New York time. So, you know, you can Google and see what time that it, we, I see that we have people in Barcelona. So kind of figure out what time that is for you all. Um, and that is going to be hosted by Oren Katz, um, who is one of the pioneers in, um, who's working at the intersection of uh, biodesign, so bi biotechnology, design, and art. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, you could check out our Twitter page. There is a link there to the event, right? Um, just like we did for this one. Yep. Okay, so let me just give you a breakdown of how this session is going to work. Uh, Grace is going to speak for roughly between a half an hour, a half an hour and 45 minutes, uh, and then we're going to do a Q&A. If you have questions uh, that come to your head while she's speaking, go ahead and type them in the chat. We'll be recording them, and then at the end of Grace's talk, we'll try to address all of the questions. Uh, Ian and I will, will act as MCs. So... Um, yeah, so um, lastly, I'd like to introduce our wonderful speaker for today, uh, Grace Knight. Let me just read her bio very quickly. Uh, Grace is a designer, artist, and woodworker under the title Product Fabricator at Ecovative Design. She holds a BFA in Industrial Design with a concentration in Nature, Culture, and Sustainability Studies from the Rhode Island School of Design, and was awarded the Yusuf Karsh Student of Design Science Award in 2016 and the Rachel Carson Award in 2018. Grace designs with the end of life, with end life of materials in mind, and aims to create positive environmental impact through her practice. Thank you for joining us, Grace. Thanks, Grace. We're gonna go off. We'll, we're still here. Um, yeah, we're gonna take, turn our mic off and have you be spot spotlighted. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thanks, okay. everyone. Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. Um, like they said, I'm Grace Knight with Incubative Design. I'm an industrial designer here. Um, and some things that I do are, I get to play with our cool materials, um, figure out the strengths and the limitations, and then propose products in industry, and then make the concepts for these little one-off prototypes, which I then document and add to our website. Um, we're a small company, so in addition, I do a few other things as well. Everyone helps each other out. Um, so it's really good to be here today. Um, thank you all for also joining and your interest in biodesign and biofabrication. Um, just, it's an emerging industry and um, we're all in it together through our interdisciplinary collaboration. So let's get started. Um, Ecovative's journey began in 2007, as you can see on this timeline created by Biofabricate. Um, represented are a bunch of other designers in this space. And so all these designers create technology with their materials using microorganisms. Um, just as the Industrial Revolution utilized iron, in the same way, we utilize biology and we build with biology. Um, so if you haven't been to Biofabricate before, 
It's at the new lab in New York City. And this past year was my first year going as well. Uh, this timeline table is really cool. It starts from 2007 all the way to 2017 and is a timeline. So along it, these companies have various products throughout all the different years. Um, and there's a key. So the five notable organisms which you can follow along the table are yeast, mycelium, mammalian cells, algae, and bacteria. And so the goal is that you follow and you go down the table and you can see where we started and where we're going with this technology. And in my opinion, I think it's the future. So it's really exciting to have a conference one day with all these speakers in the space come together and you get to see the uniting of uh, science, technology, and design under one roof. Uh, it's not only companies that come, but students are able to come, designers, and um, it's just kind of a gathering space for this emerging technology. Um, a book that I always recommend to beginners who are just starting to learn about this technology, um, you know, picking up where we've been, like I said, and where we're going is <laughs> appropriately named Biodesign by William Myers. Um, why I really like this book is it says not only companies and their projects, but um, it's, it's showcasing each material as well. So it will tell you the strain of bacteria that was used uh, in this project or was yeast used in this project as well. Um, and so it's not only, a lot of the companies that are at Biofabricate are in this book, so it's good to read up on that. But um, it's also showing uh, discursive concepts and some provoking art exhibitions that happened uh, implementing any products that are in market, but then also showing technological breakthroughs. So highly recommend this book. Um, one company that designs with yeast is called Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, their technology is utilizing yeast cells and adding scents into the DNA to then grow out. Uh, yeast has a nucleus, so what they do is genetically modify the DNA, and then from there, grow it out in a bioreactor, and they're able to create a perfume of their choosing or of the company's choosing. Um, so this is really exciting, and Ginkgo knows what more this technology can do. So not only are they creating perfume, but they just opened an exhibition in Paris, France called Resurrecting the Sublime. And they were able to recreate the scent of an extinct flower that was once native to Hawaii. Uh, so this is it's so exciting. You know, no one smelled this flower for well over 100 years, and here we're able to do this with their awesome biotechnology. Um, so the exhibition, if you stand under this wafting black box hood, uh, the scent is falling upon you, and then you can watch this video and see what the plant hypothetically looked like in its time. And this is a touring exhibition, which will be in a few other locations in Europe. Um, so what happens when you have yeast and native bacteria working together in a colony. That's called a SCOBY, which stands for a symbiotic culture of yeast, or bacteria and yeast, SCOBY. <laughs> and uh, if you don't know already, SCOBYs are necessary for brewing kombucha, which is just fermented tea. Um, similar to a sourdough starter, when you use a living organism to transform your food, the organism is growing as well. So rather than use you know, throw out the organism, we could use this for an application. Um, Suzanne Lee realized that this would be a suitable leather replacement because it already looks like skin um, and it dyes very well as, as well. Um, so what she did was start BioCouture, which uh, shows a leather alternative, which is environmentally more sound, uh, as well as showing that microorganisms can be used to build materials. Uh, from there, Suzanne Lee and Amy Congdon today, uh, they're also the people who held the Biofabricate Conference. They work with Modern Meadow. Uh, Modern Meadow's organism is also yeast, but they use it to create collagen, which then they make into a fake leather material as well. And if you don't already know, um, when you are utilizing microorganisms, you have to not only design the technical process, but you have to be observing the success of the microorganism to then get the most ideal growth conditions, therefore the best part and the best yield in the end. 
Um, similarly, I work for Ecovated Design, and we have also dabbled in making a faux leather before. Uh, but our organism, our fungus, is mycelium rather than yeast. Um, so using a very specialized process, we're able to grow a sheet of pure mycelium, which we then can make into a leather and dye it like so, um, with teas or plant-based dyes. This technology is exclusively licensed to Bolt Threads, however, um, adding to Bolt Threads' growing platform. They're traditionally known for making spider silk without spiders. They use a liquid extract silked protein, um, which has a few different applications. But now they have Milo, and the first commercial product is a driver bag. Uh, this was just funded on Kickstarter in the fall, actually. So it's uh, going to be implemented in, you know, in society soon being used, which is real exciting. First mycelium leather bag. Um, I just want to take a step back and explain mycelium, because now you've heard me say it a few times. Uh, so what is mycelium? Mycelium is the underground network. What we know as the mushroom is actually just the fruiting body, as you can see in this diagram. And the mushroom is alive and well under the soil through this integrated network. Um, and when it is mature enough, that's when it produces the fruiting body because it's trying to reproduce. The fruiting body has the spores which drop and then you're able to grow the mushrooms more so. Um, going further back, I can remember taking environmental science and we never talked about mushrooms. And I don't know what the case is with you guys, but we only talked about plants and animals and mushrooms, they're their own kingdom. They're entirely separate. In fact, uh, mushrooms actually evolved before plants. Um, <laughs> after a natural disaster, mushrooms are the first species to colonize that barren rock face. It's actually a lichen, which is a fungus. And lichen is thought to be the first fungus that teamed up, that evolved and teamed up with photosynthesizing organisms such as algae. Um, archaeological findings have also shown that mushrooms like this shown, a prototaxite, uh, we found a huge fossil of it. It used to be 26 feet tall, we believe. Um, but during this time, the plants were only small grasses, as you can see in this uh, artistic rendering of the prototaxite drawing. Um, and oftentimes, these plants didn't even have any root structure at all. Um, and so because these ancient plants were lacking roots, or many of them were, but mushrooms were very developed in the root system, they actually co-evolved together. So the mycelium would physically grow into the plant, and they would be sharing nutrients and working symbiotically. Um, so the plant would photosynthesize and make sugars, which was given to the mycelium. And then in turn, the mycelium was extracting water and nutrients from the soil, such as phosphorus, and giving that to the plant. Um, and as you can see, this relationship still exists. The plants today that have mycelium network connected to it are much well grown, much better grown. <laughs> they are um, healthier and more vibrant and uh, are connected to the other plants as well through this mycelium network. Um, and not only to plant health is mycelium important, but so many insects too. Um, Termites, I know, cultivate mushrooms in their nests. A bunch of ant species cultivate with mushrooms, some leafcutter ants. I know when a queen sometimes will leave her old nest to go, a young queen, and then make a new colony, she'll bring a teeny piece of mushroom with her and plant that into her new colony to then have that mushroom in their nest. Um, but not only ants and termites, honeybees, there's an increasing amount of research being done around honeybees and their relationship with mycelium. So these honeybees are in the gardening bed and they're sucking the moisture off of the mycelium. And it's actually shown to be super important for their immune system, that's why they're doing it. Um, if the honeybee's immune system is depleted, they don't have mycelium or they're not strong enough, that's when they're subject to varro mites as well as colony collapse disorder. Um, some of this research is coming from Stanford University after preliminary research was uh, being done by Paul Stamets. If you haven't Paul, heard of Paul Stamets before, he's a mycologist and an author. He has written many different books. Uh, I recommend Mycelium Running, 
as my second book of the day and homework would be to read chapter one if you can get your hands on this book. Um, I keep on rereading it. There's a lot of knowledge in mycelium running. Um, he starts by talking about the intelligence of mycelium in the first chapter. So that's why I think it's super important for everyone to at least read that. Um, but also in the book, he talks about microremediation and how certain species of mushrooms can filter out disease from water. Uh, certain species of mushrooms are antibiotics to um, certain bacteria. So there's definitely a correlation between health and using mushrooms. And in the end, he, can, he teaches you how to grow mushrooms yourself in this book. So uh, all encompassing, please buy this book. <laughs> I'm not, he didn't tell me to say that, but I just love this book as well as biodesign. Um, but back to chapter one, he talks about this integrated forest floor and network and dubs that the mycelium is the internet of the forest because it is all encompassing and communicating with the plants as well as the other species and insects for that matter. Um, and we can see here that this spreading branching pattern is an inherent geometry found in nature. So to the left, I mean on the right, on the bottom corner, these are neurons, which are our brain cells, and they're interconnected and branching as so. Dark matter, this is a computer generated model of the space between galaxies. And it's a similar woven geometry. And here as well is the internet, which is another computer simulated model. And look at that connectedness. It's the same as mycelium. So we can see that this is um, inherent everywhere. And as you can see here, this is mycelium on a 20 micron scale using a scanning electron microscope image. Uh, the same branching pattern, interwovenness. There's no set geometry, it's just a web. Um, so very, very interesting. Uh, and then this is our mycelium on a macro scale. We use a special incubation method where this mycelium is aerial mycelium. It is growing up off of the substrate. And so we have 100% pure mycelium foam versus the mycelium traditionally is grown through the forest floor and it's binding things together, growing between particulates, and it's a composite for that matter. This mycoflex is opposite. It is only mycelium, which is very interesting. Um, and like I said earlier, di different climate conditions or different environmental conditions yield various results um, and lead to the success of the organism. Also to mention, this is grown in nine days, which is super exciting. Um, and because that it has this not limiting geometry, it grows to whatever size tray we put it in. And the structure allows us to have many different applications. So some that we're exploring right now um, in the food scaffolding, we're able to grow cells to our bouncy material and give it that kind of uh, texture that whole cuts of meat have. But in a vegan way, we're trying to work with cell-based and plant-based meat. So that's an awesome alternative. In beauty, traditional makeup sponges use uh, oil and they're marketed as disposable because they're one-time use, but they actually don't degrade. So if we could use our micro, microfoam material, microflex material to, you know, for actual disposable reasons, it would actually compost at the end of the cycle, which is exceeding too. Um, another application would be in footwear. It is actually a great replacement for the uh, support padding and the midsole of the shoes, which currently do not have an environmental alternative. And why use a synthetic thermal liner or down feathers if we could use our Mycoflex. Our Mycoflex has an R value of four, I believe. So it's pretty comparable to existing uh, thermal insulating liners on the market. And that's another thing we are striving for. But besides naturally thermally insulating, Mycoflex has a bunch of properties that we have to strive for with man-made synthetics. For example, uh, the material is rebounding and breathable because of its open cell structure. Um, the mycelium is naturally hydrophobic, 
water droplets pool on top of it and run off rather than soak into it. Uh, it is also naturally flame resistant. As you can see, the image on the left is a torch against our micro composite and it isn't burning, it's not catching flame, it's just char in the outside, but it's not a good ignition source. And these are just inherent properties of mycelium. We don't have to add anything to it to get these properties. Um, and like I said, a microcomposite, which I just highlighted with the flame, that is actually what we are traditionally known for. We're known for a microcomposite packaging. Uh, while we are trying to branch out into those new avenues with our second platform, microcomposite is our first platform. Um, what we do with this is use local agricultural waste, such as hemp fibers and corn husks, and we add our mushroom culture to it, and the material will grow throughout the substrate or throughout the particulates of our choosing and bind it together to make a strong composite material. This material will grow in only six days and can be fabricated like you would with uh, a table saw, a bandsaw like wood, you can sand it, you can laminate it to other wood, you can paint it or put finish on it. So it works in a similar way, but uh, the great news is it's actually compostable. And at the end of the day, it's not slowly rotting, but it has an infinite shelf life in the ideal conditions and will only break down if you break it up and add it to the soil. It's entirely dependent on those soil microbes to degrade the material. And due to Ecovative's growing sector into more of the foam market, we decided to give our microcomposite and the packaging that we're traditionally known for a space to live on its own. So we've created a website called mushroompackaging.com. And you can go there and buy uh, pre-existing corner blocks for shipping in boxes, non-styrofoam coolers, uh, seed starter trays, which are perfect for springtime coming up as well as the wine shipper you just saw on the previous image. And the goal with this is to team with individuals or small packaging plants and provide mushroom materials to the local area. Uh, and also to share this technology with others. A few years ago, we started Grow It Yourself kits, which um, are now available as well online. Um, so. This is important to us because we can create this technology, but change really happens with everyone involved. So this is now available for you to grow your material at home. Uh, it makes a great project for a STEAM workshop or a classroom project. Um, we think what better way to learn but through hands-on doing and making yourself. Um, And this lives on its separate website as well. We decided to branch out the MICO community, we call it, and the education side of Ecovative and put it on a website called Grow Bio. Um, so this is where you can buy GIY kits if you're interested in using them for your project for the Biodesign Challenge. Um, and something that's really interesting is the Learn section will give you not only instructions, but YouTube videos on how to work with the material, some tips and tricks that we've learned over the years, but also some of our YouTube videos give you a little inside scoop of what goes on at Ecovative, which is always fun to see. Um, and another education tab is the forum, which is where people post projects and we encourage you to add your own projects into the mix. You're welcome to comment and like these projects and the point behind this is the MICO community, um, creating a space for people to put their stuff on, let others see it. This is a new material and it's a new process and everyone being able to work together on a community level and communicate about their successes and their failures is kind of the, the point with the forum page. Um, and so, some examples of things that have been grown with mycelium. This one is found on the forum page. It's a group of students at Georgia Tech, and they decided to make a huge mycelium monolith structure. And this is really exciting because traditionally we hear about smaller projects or like, you know, tabletop things that we can do. And a lot of the stuff we do are pretty small too. 
So it's really exciting that someone was ambitious and did a project of this magnitude. Um, so they have these wooden walls, which is their mold that they filled. And they have plastic bags, which they put the uh, GIY material into. As you can see, she's pouring the material there. And after it grew for a few days, they then removed each of these wooden walls one by one until only the mycelium stood. And rather than baking it in an oven to dehydrate it, they just let the sunlight dehydrate it in that manner, which is totally suitable. Another artist that is working with our material is John Grunden, and you can find him on Instagram under broken hair. So he does synthetic taxidermy, which means it's not a real animal that he is stuffing and filling. He will put the mycelium into a mold and put the outside with clay and then paints it really realistically so it looks like a living animal or not a living animal, but it looks like an animal and he'll even add in hair and put in like a unicorn horn or something if that's what the person desires. So I think this is a fun alternative to some sort of casting or mold making. Um, here's another large scale project. So the Hi-Fi Tower was created by the Architecture Studio of the Living for the MoMA PS1. And all these little bricks were hand-packed at Ecovative and then installed on the MoMA site uh, for an outdoor summer event. Uh, you can see holes in the tower towards the bottom and more increasingly at the top, and that was for passive cooling, so kind of like a termite mound. So when the air goes by, the heat is going to go up and out. Uh, so that was intelligently designed. And it has a little bit of a wood and a metal structure supporting it because it's just so large. Um, good news is, after this was disassembled, the all the material was composted afterwards. So that is like the true intention of this using hemp and corn and mycelium, all these natural materials, like at the end of the day, we're not adding stuff to the landfill. It's a plastic alternative that is being composted and nutrient is going into the soil, which is gonna go into a plant and be uptaken. So it's all part of a cycle. Um, so this is a really cool design at the intersection of where 3D printing has taken us, as well as where the biotechnology has taken us. So Eric at Crown Design, Crown is uh, one of our licensees in the Netherlands. He 3D printed this chair and then packed the material with oyster mushroom. And instead of desiccating it or killing the spores, he just let it dry out ambiently. And if you don't kill the spores, it will fruit. This is the fruiting body, this is the the part of the mushroom that we don't let it get to at Ecovative. Um, but it's a really beautiful sculptural chair in the end. Um, this is a aesthetic that a lot of artists like to play with, having mushrooms grow on it, but um, it's not entirely hyperallergenic. So at Ecovative, we don't let the mushrooms grow. Uh, we do bake it in the oven, so it is inert and all the mushrooms are killed. I would also say that some museums don't like the idea of having living spores indoors inside so if you want to do something like this just communicate with <laughs> the environment that you're going to be in and see if that's okay and one last project i want to highlight is uh, artisan designer danielle trophy who has her lights in the one hotel at the brooklyn bridge venue she actually has two different micro composite lights one of them is the grow light, which you can buy and assemble and grow your own lampshade at home. And then the other one is Much Loom, which is pictured here. And she was commissioned to do, I think, around 100 of these for the one hotel. Um, and she's of a similar mindset where this is all through communication and collaboration and really trying to change the public's perception of mushrooms from one of mycophobia to one of mycophilia. So it's really awesome working with her closely. Um, and I would just like to say that this is also an emerging theme. Instead of having indoor spaces be sterile, uh, it's a trend now to make indoor spaces incorporating the natural. We're then merging kind of like the 
what once used to be two separate worlds into one ecosystem. We're bringing nature indoors. And I feel like that merging and like that cohesion is really what nature intended. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I am happy to answer any questions you guys have. Um, I didn't talk about failures and limitations, which is something that I can speak to as well, just so you know, like what the microcomposite material can do. Um, yeah, so fire away, go for it. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. So many questions. And Hi. Just don't stop. I know. I bet. <laughs> so, so I'm going to categorize the first type of questions, which is, what can I get it to do? So, can I okay. dye it? What shapes can I make? Uh, can you tell me a little bit more of the porosity? Um, okay. What else can I see there? Can you? What recipes can you share? Uh, so let's start with the properties. How, what are the types of properties people have been able to achieve using mycelium as a material? So um, we have three different spec sheets that I typed up with, um, let's see, hemp, aspen shaving, and aspen chip, which are something that we typically grow on a large scale here at Ecovative rather than in a small mold. We grow in like a really big 40 by 40 inch cube. And those have vastly different densities and properties. And I would just like to say that you can use like 20% of a grow it yourself kit and then add in like 80% of your um, sterilized material, whether it be food scraps, sand, um, all, all sorts of things. I think that's where the fun and the play really is. Uh, the Each substrate, each particulate will yield different results. Got it. Are there, is, everyone's asking for recipes. Is there a place to find recipes? <laughs> recipes like for the food that we were talking about or recipes for the mixing uh, of substrates? Re recipes, I think, for making like a material. Um, we don't really have a list of recipes, although that's interesting. But I will say that we, that's a good idea. But we did initially have 50% corn and 50% hemp blend. Now we do 100% hemp. We've also played with canaf. Um, but if you were to go into our substrate room here, we have like everything from pet bedding to like denim shoddy, like the lint from your dryer. Um, there's all sorts of things that you can use. So that's kind of like play around and, you know, post on the forum and say this worked really great. And then maybe you can like start a trend <laughs> and everyone else will now use your recipe. <laughs> What yeah. does does uh, when you grow the material does it take on dyes? Um, is it water repellent? So I would recommend dyeing after it's done growing. We have tried to dye with the mycelium still growing, and like I said briefly about it removing uh, disease from waterways and antibacterial properties, it does a really good job and will eat the dye. So don't try to dye it while it's growing. It will just purify and remove the dye. So we dye it post-process. And I really like using plant-based dyes or teas. And that's typically after we take it out of the oven and it's dry. It takes paints really well as well. Got it. Uh, we have a question about reactions to acid and basic liquids. And then just about um, just one about water repellents uh, and things like okay. that. Okay. Um, so our material will float on water to a certain point because it is wood-based and mycelium is hydrophobic. But that being said, if you submerge it and the water gets in between all the particulates, it will become waterlogged. So it's not, you know, waterproof. It has no coating except for the actual mycelium itself. Uh, we grow the material for six days and then we do an additional two days of potting where we have the material popped out of the mold and then it's in an incubation chamber with some plastic around it. So the humidity is around 60% and that is causing the mycelium to grow on the outside of the part and make it all nice and fuzzy. And that soft fuzzy overgrowth is what is really the hydrophobic property of it, as well as like the, the mycoflex is only that soft overgrowth because it's only the mycelium. 
Do people put coatings on it to, to kind of seal it in so that it, it's more water repellent than otherwise? Yeah, you can do that. Um, it's not entirely necessary if you're just doing some packaging parts and stuff. Um, I feel like the fuzzy overgrowth is pretty water repellent on its own and it feels really nice. So when you add some sort of like a water-based poly, it's gonna, you're not gonna be able to feel the softness of the material anymore. And it is kind of part wood. So then the wood material gets a little sharp in my experience. I've uh, worked with our material and sanded and uh, put finish on it for acoustic tiles and uh, such like that, which it's softer without a finish, but it definitely is protected. I recommend a water-based poly and I also use uh, like milk paint, which is pretty natural too if you are going to fabricate with it in that way. Uh, one of the questions I thought was really fun, what are the most common mistakes that people make when growing with water material? Um, I would say your workspace is not clean. It doesn't have to be overly clean. I don't, don't necessarily do this and then get back to me that it didn't work for you, but uh, before coming here, I grew mycelium from Ecovative's GOI kits like in my kitchen pots on my kitchen floor and I don't think I even sterilized anything because I was just not listening to that part of the instructions <laughs> but, so I would say you should sterilize a little bit like I would use just some 70% alcohol and wipe down your bowls and your mixing materials and that should be good um, just to make sure there's no dust and other organisms trying to colonize. And that's the com competition between the mycelium because um, everything's alive. And um, another thing would be temperature, surprisingly. So like I said, the success of this organism's growth is entirely on its habitat as well as, you know, some things we can't control. Like in the summertime, it gets really, really hot. So it may get stressed out and it may be slightly discolored because the mycelium gets stressed. Or in the winter time, if it's too cold, I would say like below 65 degrees, then the mycelium is just stunted from day one and sometimes can't quite recover. So your part may not be well grown if temperature is beneath. We typically grow our material at like 75 to 80 degrees. Got it. Um... How long does it usually take for it to decompose after you grow the material? I, I assume it, it depends on the volume that you're growing and then obviously the, the textures that you're going to put. Yeah, um, with our standard material, the hemp blend, I would say 30 days and you have to break it up and incorporate it into the soil. If you just leave the material on top of the soil and it's still a solid part, it's not going to break down without it kind of being broken up and introduced to the soil microbes. Well, let's say I was making, I don't know, an insole or something along those lines, or, you know, the, how long would it last? Mm -hmm. um, if it's just either sitting on the shelf or sitting in my, in my cabinet. Oh, indefinitely. If it's indoors, uh, it, it won't break down. It's, it's not living anymore because it's dehydrated and it has, you know, no uh, degrading organism attacking the material. So indoors, it, it's like many, many, many years. <laughs> Got it. I like this question from Justice. He asks about um, genetically engineering mycelium. So what are the possibilities for engineering the organism? Um, what properties would you engineer into it, or traits? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I would say um, one thing that we're trying to do at Ecovative is kind of work mycelium with E. coli. And if a certain pathogen is present, then perhaps the mycelium will exhibit some sort of characteristic to show us that it is present. Like stay stay away from this particular house because the walls are this color or there's like a relationship that we're kind of playing with where we can use mycelium for its intelligence and its reaction 
when certain diseases are uh, present or being exhibited. So I think there's definitely some integration and some correlation that can go on between there. Got it, got it. Um, I mean, the questions just keep coming. <laughs> so uh, this, one's from, <laughs> this one's from Jennifer Verakamp. Hi, Jennifer, she's teaching at Mass Art. Uh, Hi. Growing mycelium for mushroom spores um, in a type of incubator, and the mycelium is now growing steadily, congratulations, in jars with substrates. Wondering, what is the next step to create the material? So they're, they're at the incubation stage, now what? Growing my mycelium for mushroom spores in a type of incubator. Okay. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, it sounds like um, her material, is she making the, the mushroom inoculum herself? It sounds like she's already growing the mycelium into the jars. So you're going to get a nice cylinder, right? Okay. Wait, yes, yes to inoculum or yes to growth? Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I think, yeah, she's answering, but it sounds like they're, okay. they grew it from scratch. Uh, cool. And I, I think the, probably the next step is to take it out of the incubator, let it dry. Um, well, if you are making, oh, sweet, cool. So what, what I would do next is, um, yes, take the material out and break it up and make sure everything is very clean. Also, this is something we do like in our clean lab with the inoculum and you're going to add a certain percentage of your inoculum to whatever substrate you want and make sure you keep that mixture, uh, refrigerated if you're not going to use it initially because the shelf life of that is really important but um, then I would add depending on how much mass you have I would add in flour and water to then wet your dry substrate and then the flour is the food for the mycelium to then eat and grow and I would mix that all up and let that grow out for about four days or so and then break it up after you get that white growth in whatever bag you started growing with your new substrate, break that up and then I would put it into the mold. Um, someone said, what flour? I use white flour. You can use clear flour. Um, I don't really know if the flour varies in, I guess, in result. I'm sure it will, but we typically use white or clear flour and that works fine. Where is, is there the proportion of water to flour? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm just, you, um, where people can grab technical detail? Yes. So using starting from the dry material to make it a wet material to put it into a mold, all that is expressed through our PDF at ecovativedesign.com slash instructions. And that should walk you through. And that's kind of our basic instruction manual for our GIY kit. But if you are adding your own substrate, then I would just, you know, try to keep the mass the same, but do a ratio of maybe 80 to 20 or 30 to 70. Um, is that, are, are there directions in Paul Stamets' book as well about growing materials or this is, this is sort of discovered by? Um, no, he does, he does give examples. What he typically does is, um, I just read something in his book and what he has done is inoculated a rope. And this is all kind of to grow the mushroom fruiting body itself rather than the mycelium kind of like we're doing. So um, I guess you could stop his process before you get to the fruiting body stage and that it should work pretty fine. But he said like you could inoculate a rope, you can inoculate little birch um, dowels. And then if you hammer that birch dowel with the mushroom, uh, you know, culture in it into an old tree stump, then you could grow that mushroom just like from that tree stump, which is really cool. So there's there's definitely a lot of good knowledge in that book. Um, well, all right, I'm going to take a step back and ask you, you know, what are you particularly excited about uh, going forward with mycelium? What makes you really excited to come into work every day? And <laughs> um, so 
I've said this before and um, I mean it though. I feel like Ecovative is my dream job because I was stuck between a scientist and a designer and, you know, thought about doing environmental science and that was kind of testing the soil or the water and then, okay, it's polluted. What are we going to do about it? So the designer in me wants the solution. And I feel like coming into work every day is I'm wearing many different hats and I'm able to play with this material and propose solutions. But then I also help like the genetics team fabricate something in the wood shop or um, I'm just bouncing around a lot and there's always new projects to work on and there's always something going on. So it's a really cool space where um, I truly feel alive and fulfilled going to work because I know that this is a new material and it's a good material for the earth and no one else is doing this stuff yet or before. So that to me is really exciting. I remember cutting my first uh, piece of mycelium composite on the table saw and I was like, this is the first time ever. And I was just so happy. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you another question about that. So um, I want, you know, given that mycelium have been around really forever, long mm -hmm. before we, we ever came onto this planet, uh, given that we have lots of experience working with it as, as food, mm -hmm. why hasn't mm -hmm. it really taken off as a material until now? Wow, that's a really good question. I don't know how well I can answer that question. Um, I think... I think perhaps there's like a, maybe some separation between what mushrooms are doing in the wild and what we want mushrooms to do. And perhaps in the past, using it as a food source only is kind of putting it in a box that we're able to control and contain. And like, we understand how to grow mushrooms for food purposes. But um, if you go out into a forest, you see mushrooms are present in that type of condition naturally and very happily. So, you know, why is that? Why are they growing between the leaf litter in such a way? And it's so strong, why don't we use it that? So I think that's, Ecovid was born out of the reverence and appreciation for the resilience of mycelium. And um, Eben talks about, our, our CEO, Eben, grew up on a farm in Vermont and he talks about, you know, being a farm boy and seeing mushrooms grow and just why is no one doing this yet? So <laughs> I think it's really exciting. And I think um, all of us are very inspired by everything you've just said as well. And I think um, we had a question about um, how can people do this at home too, um, including uh, Danielle's lamps that we see in the slide too. Um, can you mm -hmm. kind of give us how people can start doing this on their own if they haven't already? Yeah, yeah. I think a good place to start is um, the Grow It Yourself kit already has the mushroom spores, the mushroom inoculum in it. So you don't have to do any process besides just rehydrating it and adding that flower and following instructions at ecovativedesign.com slash instructions. And then from there, it's totally entirely up to you what you want to grow. So through, through the biomaterial being available, you can make a lampshade by just packing a bowl and then putting a smaller bowl inside. You can, you know, make a, a corner block yourself. But um, something I'm actually encouraging and what Ecovative would like to see is not anything that we have seen before or done ourselves. This is, we'd rather have you play with this material and get really weird and come up with something super sci-fi and totally brand new. And if it's a complete failure, that's amazing. Honestly, I think failure is a great place to learn from. <laughs> um, so we are interested in the exploration rather than a finished polished product that we've already seen before. So through that, I guess, just playing with the material and really seeing what it can do. So yeah, combine, mix, destroy, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, interestingly, I feel like mycelium is having its its moment in, in the cultural spotlight as well. I feel it too. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm specifically thinking about the, the whole Star Trek series, uh, TV oh, yeah. show, where basically <laughs> yeah. the, the universe is connected by mycelium. What do you think? You know, is the guy's happening? name is Paul Stamets, right? <laughs> 
Is that right? Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What do you think? What do you think is is happening? Why why the sudden explosion of excitement and interest? And obviously, you're seeing that there's a really robust community of people who are growing material, uh, experimenting with it, doing so much with it. Yeah, I think we just kind of got over a big hurdle. Like I said, there's a lot of mycophobia, and now people are like, "Oh wow, this stuff's really cool," and people are loving it. And it used to be kind of the dubbed weirdos playing with mycelium or like mushrooms and like they just it was a misunderstanding and I think whenever people don't understand something they're instantly kind of taken aback or like afraid of it rather than like interested in engaging and wanting to learn more it's more like this is unfamiliar and unusual so I'd rather not and uh slowly but surely I feel like we've done a good job of <laughs> not ecovative but um just the people who do love mushrooms have done a great job about sharing this with other people. And now you can see like chaga tea is available at your local farmer's market or people are putting mushrooms in chocolate. Like it's, it's being better understood, therefore being widely accepted and it's more abundant everywhere as well. So this one's from justice again. So what are the first lessons you would, uh, you would teach for first timers? First timers. Um, guess learning to work with mycelium. Um, I would follow the instructions closely, but I would embrace all the learning opportunities and it will be successful any, any which way it grows because um, every opportunity in this process you're learning from. So I think that's where the success is. And it's not the same process as wanting to make a piece of furniture so you go to Home Depot and you buy your material and then you can do your process. It's like you are making the material and you're trying to fabricate with the material and that's just a whole learning curve. So um, it is pretty straightforward to work with, but like I said, it's living. So it, it may yield different results, different times, just as we all do. So. <laughs> so kind of jump in, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah I, would say, I would say no time is better than now. And the only way you're going to really learn is if you just get your hands dirty and you start watching and observing and having that scientific mind and that kind of like analytical observation. You can like formulate what you expect it to be. But if it's not that, why isn't that? that the case you know you're learning depending on the outcome are there ways to use its networking property so in two ways i mean one in the, the fact that it doesn't grow geometrically and it can grow interesting mm -hmm. uh, and something that might be exploitable but also you know, this is a follow-up question what do you is there something you can do with its ability to really network with other organisms um, sense act almost as, as, as a communication system that as quote unquote a kind of living engineer. Yeah, yeah. I think that is something I've been thinking about recently. And I'm not as much of a scientist on the genetics team as they are, so that's a great question for them. But um I could see mycelium being some sort of uh kind of like a organic circuit board because of its ability to communicate. And like I said, it could respond like a, a biosensor, so it can respond differently based on whatever organism is present. I think that could be really interesting. Um, so there's a potential to work alongside that way and use the communication between plants. And I know that some people are working on uh, mycelium as a biosensor with also Arduino inside a beehive <laughs> to study the bee population. So it's kind of like, here's the biomaterial, which is also technology. Um, here's our current technology with like what, 3D printing, CNC, all this stuff that is now readily available for everyone. And then here's nature and an organism and throw it all together and what do you get? I think hopefully a better understanding of how nature does what it does and why it does it so well. That's great. Yeah, last year, um, Biodesign Challenge, 
We had a team called Materials mm -hmm. where they were really trying to build interfaces between, well, in their case, magnetic materials and mycelium um, to create new forms. So I, I think the integration of the biotech and then other types of technology is going to be really exciting. Interesting poss possibilities, students. The other thing that I think you said that's really interesting is imagining, you know, if you're already making food material uh, from non-living mycelium, if you're making, you know, garments, if you're making uh, hydrophones and things of that nature, what what does it look like if those things are living and also responsive? So I'd, mm -hmm. I would shoot that question out to the students and see what they come up with. That could be really exciting. Um, Here's a really great question from Giovanna, uh, all the way in Colombia. Thanks for joining us. Um, are there any specific fungi you'd recommend people work with? Or um, what are your recommendations about people working with spores found in the environment? Um, I would say using a Ganoderma species. They're pretty, pretty hardy mushrooms um any type of natural species to the area that you live in is probably going to grow really well so around here in upstate new york temperatures can drop you know there's snow and lots of pine trees so um, we have a lot of woody conch mushrooms and those are pretty hardy and will give you you know that strong binding between the substrate structure um, on the edible side, we're also playing with some uh, certified culinary mushrooms to grow in that 100% pure mycelium format. And um, so far, the results are, you know, very independent based on the mushroom species that we are testing and using. So each mushroom is going to yield something different. I would, for strength though, I would try to pick a mushroom that is fairly strong and hardy in nature versus like a nice little cute soft mushroom which is probably just gonna like oh like wilt <laughs> it's just like too, too sensitive <laughs> which that actually leads to a really interesting question which is you know you're you're, you're growing garment materials replacements for leather uh replacements for foam how do you determine the textures uh, that you're looking for or, or the hand feel that you're looking or when you grow these materials. And I guess this goes to Kieran's question, which is how do you, what do you change in the conditions of the actual growing of the mushroom, the feedstocks, all of those things to enhance mm -hmm. those, those differences? So what are you looking so, for in terms of textures and then right. how do you grow? Um, on the composite side, you can add like sand, if you want to make more, like a smaller particulate is at such as sand or really, really fine, fine, like pet bedding. If you go to the pet aisle and there's like snake aspen bedding, that's really fine. That is going to give you a property that you could potentially sculpt with. So you could shave it down um, after it's out of the mold. Um and that will give you a smoother surface or a higher fidelity of whatever mold you want to do. Versus if you were to do a larger substrate, you're kind of limited to that size particulate for the tear out. So I get questions all the time about CNC our material. And I say with the router, the higher fidelity is gonna be the smaller substrate. If you have big substrate and you have the router go through, it's kind of like using a high grit sandpaper. You're carving away the surface based on the size of the substrate, just as like the grit on the sandpaper carves away the wood based on the size. So a smaller grit sandpaper is like a smaller grit in the substrate. And it will just make a much more polished surface if you do that sort of thing. Um, and that gives it different properties if you want it to be denser, you could add in, I think we have a heavy mix online as well, which will just, you know, make it more dense and more rigid. But that is for composite. As for the Mycoflex, um, I would say habitat growing conditions. So we have these big incubators 
and we're able to control the humidity and the temperature. And that environmental condition is so controlled that it will gives us um, the, the part that comes out of it is kind of curated based on how we alter those conditions, this environment. Got it. So not just the temperature, the humidity, we're talking about CO2 content in the air. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Totally controlled. Think about it as like a little weather pod and we mm -hmm. put our uh, substrate with the mycelium and the mycelium is growing up off of the substrate and then we just shave off the pure mycelium and that's that's what we get. But it's totally weather controlled and we that's closed for days while it's growing. We don't go in and out. So just going back to the question of textures and hand feel and all of the things that you have to think about when you are selling a, a fabric, um, I guess the question is what's possible? Like how how diverse can we get? Can we get something like felt? Can we get some? I know we're getting stuff like uh, leather. Like how how what's the range here? Um, the range is quite vast. I would say. The leather has a specific uh, end process that gives it that sort of texture, but um, the mycelium will also grow into like a cotton webbing we do often. And so that will give it some sort of flexibility, but also kind of that soft outside. And even the soft mycelium will grow through the soft cotton webbing. So you have this really nice like <laughs> soft mushroomy fabric. Um, so, I would recommend something like that as well. Um, but besides that, we haven't dabbled too much more in the textile realm because that is licensed to bolt threads. And, you know, we were supporting their leather production and can't technically make anything marketed as a textile because of that agreement. So um, we have developed the leather mostly to the fullest extent that we can. So beyond food, what is, where, where is Ecovator? Um, beyond food, food is definitely a push. Um, I would say that the thermal liner is a big push too, as well as the shoe foam. So we're currently communicating with some big brand companies and signing some NDAs. And then our goal is to have them help us with the whole technology process. Like, okay, you need a shoe foam to do this and this and this and communicate that to us. And then from here, we can tweak our process using our incubation in the environment to get a certain density foam, which is then supporting the shoe in that particular way. So we're currently scoping out partners for various industries, um, having those communications, signing the NDAs, and seeing where our space can land. And there's a lot of excitement because there hasn't been a valuable thermal liner that has come to market in quite some time it's mostly been a, a lot of synthetics that we've made about 50 years ago. So people are kind of itching for something valuable and I really hope that's a good application. Um, as well as the food space, uh, a lot of the cell-based and plant-based meat is ground fake meat right now and we're not, but in the real meat industry, about 50% of what is sold is actually whole cut. So we think we're good in that space too because we're providing that scaffolding to get those bake meat whole cuts. <laughs> and so I think that's a really good uh, application as well. Also, cells can grow in right. almost anything. So. <laughs> okay, we're, we're running out of time. Yeah. I, I'm going to yeah. ask one okay. last question. And this is okay. um, really about your career trajectory and where do you see biodesign as a field going? I see biodesign Given as the future. <laughs> you, you knew I was going to say that. <laughs> but how do you how do you see it developing? You know, given given where you are in the, in the emerging ecosystem uh, of bio design. Yeah. What do you see the next five years looking like? Um, I see more companies join on board, like you could see in the timeline. There was kind of like a beginning and then towards the end, there was like every year was about three companies were beginning. Um, and right now, a lot of those companies have their product made 
but aren't on market. So I see the next five years actually having this material, you know, be physical and real and purchasable by consumers. And that is my goal because we can speculate and create cool technology all day long. But I really like to see the solution and the implementation. As a designer, I'm kind of like, let's do something. <laughs> let's be proactive. So um, I see it being pushed into society in, in five years' time or so. I know a lot of companies are also doing environmental pushes to have like all compostable, recyclable packaging. There's a lot of shifting towards like making 2030, 2025, 2020, whatever their push is. Um, and I think we're in the same space like that. Excellent. Uh, so if you're if you're a student now and you are hoping to become a bio designer, hoping to pursue this as a career, you should do it. It's amazing. <laughs> what is that? Um, I actually got a question recently, and someone you know learned about biofabrication and biodesign and started emailing us as if we were kind of their academic counselor. Like, how, I'm gonna change my major, I'm gonna change my path, what do I do, what do I study? And I think it's an emerging industry that's uniting science, technology, and design. While I came from an industrial designer standpoint, which I, I recommend, I think that's pretty well encompassing as well as the business aspect. Um, there is no hard and set path. Um, I did hear that USC has a master's in biofabrication. So, and, and like maybe some other schools have something in biomimicry, but it is like on an academic level, it is just emerging. So as much as you can um, align your passions with whatever part of the sector makes sense because it's all collaboration, it's all interdisciplinary anyways, there is a place for you. And I would just read up and do a lot of research until some academic programs are available to thoroughly teach you. But if you are passionate enough, I feel like the resources are on the internet and the books are out there and you can really just learn about the field and see what works for you and what change you can make individually. That is a great, great place to end. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. Thank you. <laughs> what a wonderful session. I'm so grateful to you. Yeah. Uh, and thank yeah, you so everyone happy. for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you Nico Data, for, for putting this on. This is just this has been fantastic. Um, Aw, you're so sweet. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> don't, don't forget, folks, <laughs> that next week Warren Katz is going to join us, and I'm sure we'll have a very particular Warren Katz point of view. I <laughs> highly recommend uh, you all join us. Yes, please. And um, Grace, really, really. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, take care, everyone. We'll All see right. you soon. Signing out. Bye. Bye.